I want to thank the director. Of course, he starts off by <clears throat> mentioning my book, What is Life Worth? The Unprecedented Effort to Compensate the Victims of 9-11. Public Affairs Press, 2005, <laughs> hardbound or paperback. <laughs> now, you may have trouble finding that book today in Barnes & Noble or Amazon, don't worry. My personal supply of that book is virtually inexhaustible. <laughs> so if anybody needs a, a copy, just let the director know, we can get you a copy. I'm very glad that he did not introduce me as a model public servant. Six months ago, I was in the Gulf of Mexico in a parish in Louisiana. And I was introduced by the parish president from the BP oil spill as a model public servant. Some fisherman, very unhappy with the whole claims process, stood up in the back row, about 300 people in the crowd, st stands up, grabs the microphone and says, you bet Feinberg is a model public servant. You know what a model is? A small replica of the real thing. Downhill from there. <laughs> uh, yes, I did ask the director in the call. Uh, my work these days, although I'm a former prosecutor, my, my work these days is far afield from everyday community policing. And he made it pretty clear that that, that, that was one reason precisely that he asked me to come here for a few minutes to talk about my work and to try and learn some lessons from what I've done over the past decade that might in some way be relevant to this crowd. And when I was invited, I jumped at the chance. I am honored to be here. Uh, I believe that what you do day in and day out, usually outside of the public eye, is a tremendous force for good in this country. And at a time when there is such questioning and such uncertainty about how government can really help people in, the, in, in going forward with their daily lives, what you guys do at the local level, unparalleled in its importance and its impact. So I'm honored to be a, a small part of this gathering and to pay tribute to the people in this room who are doing a great job for the American people. Now, in one sense, I do and have interacted with local police forces. Certainly with the 9-11 fund. The director is correct. For 33 months, I administered that program. That was a program, you'll recall, enacted by Congress just 11 days after the 9-11 attacks. And the program simply stated, I mean, Congress gave it a lot of attention one day, and they passed this thing. Anybody who lost a loved one on 9-11, World Trade Center, airplanes, the Pentagon, or anybody who was physically injured, had the right, if they wanted, under this new federal law, to waive their right to litigate. You can't sue the World Trade Center or the airlines or the security guard companies, or Massport, or the Port Authority, or Boeing. But if you want to give up your right to sue, alleged domestic tortfeasors come into this fund funded entirely by the taxpayer. Tax-free money. During 33 months, 97% of all eligible families that lost loved ones or people who were injured voluntarily came into the fund. I received incredible support from local community police forces in New York City, in Washington, D.C., in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and in metropolitan regions of those areas. The program would have never worked if I didn't have the undying cooperation of local police forces in those communities. 
and, and far from those communities, in, in Los Angeles. Don't forget, there were people who died on those airplanes on 9-11 from L.A., from Boston. And wherever I went to meet with families who lost loved ones, local police services, outreach effort, getting people to attend these meetings, sometimes families of local police officers who died in New York City. But the help I got, the social service side of what you do, it would have never worked. People in those local communities didn't trust me. They didn't know what I stood for. What is this program? What do I have to, what rights do I have to give up? It was most of the time local police related services that got people to come to these meetings, that assured them that the program was on the up and up. No one writes about this stuff. This wasn't about protection. This was about social outreach to community, community validation of what I do. And I must say, the opportunity to spend a few minutes and thank local police services for what they did in validating the, the, the effort that I was making. It's not that, much, it's not that different in, in BP with the oil spill. I go down into the Gulf. Now, let me tell you something. Ken Feinberg from Boston, going down to Louisiana or Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, I mean, there's a certain degree of, shall we say, skepticism. <laughs> but when the local community leaders, not just elected officials, the police, the ambulance people, the firemen, when they're there, and they say, Mr. Feinberg, we're at a public meeting and we want to give it a chance and we want to hear about the program. Others lockstep listen and help with my credibility. So even though I'm not engaged these days in law enforcement protection, that is only a part of what you do. I'm very interested and I follow closely the community part of what you do. And I thank you for making my job a lot easier, even though for the most part it doesn't involve protection, it involves validation, credibility, give them a chance, trust them. It means a great deal. Second. What I do, some of the characteristics of claims processing in the Gulf, 9-11, Virginia Tech with the deranged gunman who killed 32 people a few years ago, when I'm called in to evaluate and process claims, individual claims submitted to me by claimants, who in good faith think they are entitled to money. In good faith. Bad things happen to good people every day in this country. And most of the time, when somebody is thrown a curveball, they absolutely are convinced they're entitled, entitled to compensation. And some of the characteristics that I've learned are important over the years. I think you should consider very carefully when evaluating your approach to Washington and how a claim for compensation, for a grant, for community policing, what are some of the characteristics that you might consider in drafting and crafting your own claim to Washington for compensation? What have we learned? We've learned the following. One, take the time. Take the time to carefully craft a proposal. I get thousands of claims every day that are, that are written in crayon that have to be sent back. 
A fisherman in, in Louisiana will submit a claim and say, I couldn't fish and I lost $20,000 and here's my documentation, a photo of him fishing. That isn't going to do it. <laughs> that isn't going to do it. Take the time. It's, you're not entitled to a claim being validated. Take the time to carefully craft a claim, demonstrating not only here is what we can demonstrate statistically, anecdotally, but here is what we conceive to be the short-term and long-term impact of that claim if it's granted. Take the time carefully. It is, it is time well spent. Second, explain in your proposal the transparency of your proposal. We want money for this purpose, and here is how we propose to let everybody know how the money's being spent, its impact, its use. Too many times I see claims procedures falter on the absence of transparency, on sunlight, on the ability of those receiving the money or granting the money. Here's how the process will work. Here is exactly open for all to see. There are no, there's no hidden agenda. I find transparency to be a big plus in how we go about processing the claims that I'm responsible for processing. Next, ongoing open lines of communication back and forth. What phone numbers, email addresses, letter addresses, opportunities, ongoing opportunities for claimant and Washington to interact constantly, coordinate thoughts, processes, going back and forth. Don't hide. Don't stay in the dark. A claim or a request for a grant that includes as part of that submission open lines of communication. We're not trying to hide anything. Very, very important. Next, consistency. Now this is really for the director and Washington to remember. Nothing undercuts the credibility of what I do more than a view of one claimant that he or she is being victimized by another claimant's. In other words, that claimant got money, why didn't I get money? That claimant earned less than me, why am I getting less, less than her? This problem, overriding problem, of perceived inconsistency. One thing I've learned about what I do, everybody counts other people's money. Everybody. It's not only I'm a waiter in Mississippi and you only gave me $14,000 for my loss as a result of the oil spill. You gave my next door neighbor who works in the same restaurant as I do and is also a waiter $20,000. Now what do you have against me? Now first, as you all know, don't always believe your next door neighbor. Human nature being what it is. Don't always assume the accuracy of your next door neighbor's claim that she got uh, 6000 more than you did. Secondly, maybe she did get more. Maybe she reported 20000 on her tax return and you reported 14000 That might be a reason why there's a perceived inconsistency. Or... Maybe we made a mistake. We have received in the BP oil spill fund in less than one year one million claims from 50 states. Canada, Mexico, we have received hundreds of thousands of claims. When BP announced 20 billion, build it and they will come, I must say, I've seen, you guys could take a lesson, I've seen some very creative claims. Very creative. 
Mr. Feinberg, I have a restaurant in Las Vegas. I can't get gulp shrimp, so I can't make shrimp scampi, and I've lost 10% of my clientele. Pay me. Mr. Feinberg, I make umbrellas for the beaches. Now, it's true, I'm in Boston. <laughs> but I've lost 12% of my beach umbrella business because no one's going to the beach in the Gulf. Pay me. Pay me. Pay me. So we've received a million claims. Idaho, Canada, Alaska, 20 claims. The point is, there may be some inconsistencies, and if there's inconsistencies, we admit it, we true it up, and we try and correct it. The point I want to make to this crowd in the grants process, it is important that you know what others are doing. But it's very important in Washington that when Washington decides where to spend a limited amount of money in tough times, that it apply a consistent criteria, consistent with federal law, but also internally consistent, to avoid a perception of bias. What do you got against Tennessee? What do you got against Idaho? I mean, that's very, very important to the overall credibility of the grants process. Consistency. Next. In my business, and I think in yours, the right to be heard. When you apply for a grant, you want the opportunity, just like claimants who come to my door. They've got my phone number. They track me down. That's all right. They want to be heard. Mr. Feinberg, you don't understand. You have denied my claim. I'm glad I got you on the phone. What do you got against me? I thought I did it the right way. Oh, now I understand. Thank you. Oh, all right. I understand now. Thanks for taking the time. I think it's very important that when you guys apply for these grants, make sure that there's, a, a, that there's an opportunity. I don't mean ongoing lines of communication once you get the money. I'm talking about the right to be heard as an advocate in making the case why your claim, your grant, your request can have a meaningful impact in your mandate. And I think the right to be heard is something that I deal with every day, every day. Giving people, it's amazing, human nature being what it is, it's amazing how effective it is. Procedurally, forget the substance, if you give people that chance, the right to be heard. Also, of course, impact. This is important. When you submit a grant, in my experience, have a section. Here's what we hope to achieve, and here's why we think we will achieve this goal, and here's why, bang for the buck, the goal that we achieve can have an impact way beyond our single application. Pervasive use, efficiency. In a time of shrinking budgets, if you fund this program, we think it'll work not only for our local community, we think it can be emulated, we think it will be valuable around the country, we think in rural areas, in urban areas, this can be suburban areas, this can be of use. So fund it. I think that all too often in my business you don't see a whole lot of um, input on the subject of impact. And the more, I'm sure that Washington asks for this, but the more that you're able to demonstrate impact and evaluation, post-operative evaluation, I think you've got an advantage that is a very, very important advantage. So those are some of the characteristics. Now, there are other things I'm involved with every day that you guys are thoroughly familiar with. Fraud. Fraud. I've received a million claims with BP. There are about 10,000 fraudulent claims. You know, nine guys on the same ship submitted the same IRS, the same tax return to the, to the dollar. Exactly the same. Here's how much we earn, 12233 Nine times, I mean, there's some suspicion. 
modified returns, scams. It's inevitable. Frankly, I think that the number of fraudulent claims submitted in BP, rather modest compared to the million that have come in the door. It's one thing for somebody to file a claim and say, I, law I can't fish, here's a picture of me fishing. That's not fraud. That's not anything illegal. He's not going to get paid, but it's not anything illegal. I'm talking about out-and-out -out fraud. Now there, the Department of Justice, Lanny Brewer, the Criminal Fraud Division, fabulous. Fabulous. We're working in, in lockstep with the department. And what are some of the steps we've taken to try and avoid fraud? Nothing will undercut the credibility of a compensation program more than paying people who fraudulently uh, seek funds. Nothing undercuts credibility more than that. The press loves those stories. This guy ripped them off and, you know, that's a problem. But with the Department of Justice, we've implemented some very good programs designed to undercut and challenge fraud uh, in the, in the uh, claims uh, process. The hotline, big success. Here are 1-800 numbers you can call if you think that there is a claimant or a citizen in your local community who's committing fraud and filing a claim with the oil spill fund. Here's a number, anonymous, just send it in. Hundreds and hundreds of leads come through that whistleblower a hotline. We have also established our own internal fraud pro anti-fraud program. So we've hired companies to assist us in spot checks, audits, you know, evaluation of claims, looking for consistent fraudulent applications where the same tricks are used or the same techniques. And we have discovered about 10,000 suspicious claims. Then we reevaluate those. We've sent on to justice about a little over 2,000 that we think are ripe for prosecution. And justice has been overwhelming in its support of the program. Finally, I want to just talk for a minute about competition for grants. Now that, in, in, uh, in American society today with the economy uh, uh, uncertain, most of what I've said today is designed to give you, as you all know better than I do, a leg up in fashioning applications and sending them to DOJ. When you talk about transparency and communication and, and credibility and lines of communication, impact, evaluation, I mean, all of that falls under the rubric of, and here's how I can ma um, submit the most favorable application that hopefully will be credible and subject to funding. There is an incredible competition today in Washington for very limited available funds. And that puts the burden on you guys, it seems to me. There was a day not so long ago when your work and this office at Justice virtually guaranteed some type of grant compensation. Those days are over. The, the, the grantees, those who submit grants now under this program, are going to have to be much more creative, much more thorough and comprehensive, much more thoughtful, frankly, in relative terms, in securing limited grant dollars. I don't suffer from that problem with my programs, you see. BP, at the suggestion of the Obama administration, announced, come one, come all, 20 billion. That's billion. No one's ever done anything like that before. No one. 
My problem with the $20 billion announcement is simply a political one. Well, why aren't you spending all the money? There's still money left over. In, in 11 months, you've spent $5 billion. Well, well, what have you done for me lately? There's $15 billion still out there. Why haven't you distributed that money? If I distributed that money to everybody who asked for a claim, the money would be gone tomorrow. Anybody can do that. That's not your problem. Your problem is not all of this money's available, file a grant. Your problem is one today of competition. Limited dollars, and there's going to be even more limited dollars. And, and sometimes I think policymakers don't really understand the importance of your work in terms of the overall availability of dollars. There aren't that many programs in this country more valuable or more uh, available to assist the general body politic population than what you guys are doing. But the fact of life is, unlike 10 years ago, you've got to be creative in establishing your program. In the 9-11 fund, people ask me this all the time, when you distributed money in 9-11, how did you decide who gets what? My book. But how, how, how did you distribute a finite amount of money? Answer, it wasn't finite. When Congress enacted the 9-11 fund, it authorized a program with unlimited dollars. There was no appropriation. None. There was no appropriation with the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. Congress basically said, Ken, whatever it's going to cost, take it out of petty cash from the U.S. Treasury. About $8 billion. Just take care of it. We don't know what a life is worth. We're not sure what a family ought to get paid. Uh, the family of a dead fireman or a dead policeman or somebody who died at the Pentagon we don't know take care of it don't come back to us for advice you work it out but remember make sure that 15 percent of the eligible claimants don't get 85 percent of the money but how you do that we're going to delegate it and we had to work that out you see but there was no appropriation $20 billion with BP, it's not a problem. There's money, more than enough money. The question is, with everybody nipping at your heels, how do you decide how much is appropriate? Who's eligible? Are you going to pay the restaurant in Boston? Of course not. But how you decide where you draw that line and how you draw that line and who's going to get what is a real public policy dilemma when you don't have that type of guidance. The other problem with BP, of course, is no one knows for sure the future. The future. Uh, yeah, business is coming back, uh, uh, Feinberg, but, but there's oil down there. And the next hurricane, that oil is going to wash up on shore. It's sitting there waiting. The fish will again turn purple. You wait and see. Well, when you're trying to resolve claims and no one knows for sure about the future, how do you decide how much is enough? BP is now criticizing me. Why are you paying for the future? There is no problem. We cleaned up all the oil. Let's wrap this up. No. There's still some environmental and economic uncertainty. Oh, there's uncertainty, but it's not because of the spill. The general economy is uncertain. So the Gulf region is uncertain. These are the problems. Now, that's different from what you guys confront. You guys confront a real competition for limited dollars. I think sometimes the people in this room have to be sort of creative artists more than scientists more than political scientists. How creative can you be 
in advancing a very substantive, worthwhile proposal. I know of no organization, no group, involved in criminal or civil justice in this country more tuned in to the need to come up with programs that really can make a difference. And frankly, the more you stay below the radar screen, the quieter your work, the more you go about your business without a lot of fanfare, without a lot of press releases, without a lot of uh, uh, advanced uh, proclamation, the better. The better. Because unlike what I do, I work every day very, very much in the public visible limelight. A day doesn't go by where I'm not criticized somewhere or thanked occasionally by a relative usually, but mostly where I'm not criticized, why aren't you giving us more, why aren't you finding me eligible, there's all this money out there, why aren't you doing this, why aren't you more like Santa Claus in getting these claims paid. I roll in and roll out. I do this assignment. I'll go back to practice law. Or I hope there won't be another tragedy. And if I'm asked to do something, what I do, ladies and gentlemen, you could do what I do very easily. You really could. What I do is not rocket science. You do the right thing. You set up criteria. If you make a mistake, you admit it. But what I do with all of this public fanfare is very, very visible. What I admire about what you do, you are not an aberration. You are not a BP or a 9-11 or a Virginia Tech. You guys labor in the vineyard every day, almost always out of the public eye, trying to make communities not only safer, but fairer, more just. And I think you, you benefit from the fact that you're not in the crosshairs. Not, not you occasionally, but you're not in the crosshairs. And for every time that there is a public discussion, debate, about a program of yours, there are scores of programs where you quietly, efficiently, and most importantly, effectively help communities. Not only be safer, but be fairer and akin to, and, and, and adhere to the rule of law. So I salute you. I'm not sure to this moment how much of what I've said is simpatico or relevant for what you do. But I must say, uh, if I can learn from any organization about how to make a claims program work effectively and fairly, it is by spending a little bit of time with you professionals. So I want to thank the director and, and, and the Department of Justice, and particularly all of you for what you do. I salute you professionals. I'd rather spend time with you than just about any organization I know of. And I appreciate the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you today. Thank you.